I'm going to take some more coffee. Committee will reconvene. Committee will reconvene. The gentlewoman from California will be recognized for five minutes. I want to thank uh, our chairman for holding this most uh, necessary hearing. And I want to commend all of our special guests on the panel for coming today. I have uh, been down uh, on special delegations to New Orleans, and I was appalled at the promises that were made and unkept. There were too many pieces of vacant property. There were too many trailers with formaldehyde. I'm a victim of formaldehyde too, and I know how you can suffer. There were too, too few medical institutions. Uh, Catholic charities, I must give them credit, came in and they set up temporary facilities to serve but so many of our schools were destroyed. So many of our universities were destroyed. My grandmother was born in Louisiana, so I have a very personal, personal affection for Louisiana. She was in a convent for 18 years. Obviously, she came out. <laughs> but so I'm very much a part of uh, that particular state and the French quarters. Uh, I, you are not the blame. We failed you, and we watched while you were being failed. I was getting a call from the stadium about how the buses were passing up the people and wouldn't stop to pick them up. I had 14 relatives that we could not find. We dispatched someone from my capital, Sacramento, to go to Baton Rouge. We finally saw one of the relatives hoisted up and taken to a hospital. So I was very much a part of that. And so I say all that to say, I want to commend you for what you have done. I want you to tell me now what we need to do in health care reform, how we can plug up the holes so that, and this was the biggest natural and national disaster we have ever had, and the world viewed it. When the dikes broke and that water flowed in like it would flow into a boat, we were all so tearful. So I know what you went through. And I want you to tell us what we need to do in health care reform that will plug up those holes and what we need to do in our system so never again will we have to go through those levels. I was not one to support Homeland Security to come and take all the agencies because I thought FEMA should be separate and apart so it could move on a dime. So in terms of health delivery, what can we do, Dr. Thompson, and Dr. Rowland, all of you, give us the input because we want to, before the end of the year, come out with a bill that will cover all Americans the right way, affordable, sustainable, accessible, and with all pre-existing conditions. And uh, I just really appreciate uh, Congressman uh, Kennedy, who put a particular emphasis on health care. I had a family in my home whose son had a breakdown when he went back home and found out they didn't have insurance, they lost everything, and so I know the need for mental health services. So let's just go down the line, uh, starting with DeSalvo, and why don't you give me the input on how we can make sure that health delivery is sustainable and what we should do. Well, Congressman, thank you for remembering and recognizing all that pain. We really do appreciate it. I shared um, it. Icon. It's your I'm, I'm sorry, sir. Um, I just wanted to thank you. And what can we do? I, 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 um, we've done a lot with very little, and we're not asking for much. I think what... what and by the, the way, I'm from California, <laughs> the largest state in the union, and the first state to be a majority of minorities. So don't think that every Californian feels the way I do, but you know how I feel. Okay, go ahead. 
We, um, I think what we've built is really valuable. Um, it's an investment um, by the taxpayers post-Katrina. It's helping recover our city. It's building jobs. It's building workforce development, new opportunity for people. It's not just about health care. Huh. To continue it, the gap is you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of $30 million a year. Um, it means that we can continue this until there are other options, until finding uh, special mechanisms to pay for the uninsured aren't really needed because there are no uninsured. And it would be really a shame to disassemble this investment, which is really what we're facing in the fall. So finding those funds it could be um, really as straightforward as allowing the, the Louisiana Recovery Authority, the LRA, perhaps to use some the CDBG funds they have in a more urban renewal fashion instead of just for housing. We don't want to not give people housing, but if we think that we have access and we can give them the fabric of community around their house, i.e. health care, that would be helpful. And there's some other opportunities perhaps with the disproportionate share funds to redirect it from using it only for hospital-based care, but also for community-based care. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman, and I appreciate the feeling of just knowing that you care. So many people showed that to us, and it just means so much. I'm not a policy person. I'm a person who sees people on the front lines. I'm at ground zero in the lower ninth ward, but I could tell you what the impact should feel like. Okay. It should feel like a person should be able to come to the clinic and not worry about whether I can pay for it or not. It should feel like I can get the services that I need, whether it's primary health care or specialty services. And I just want to say that this has been a wonderful collaboration. Because of the Primary Care Access and Stabilization Grant, we have been able to work together. Something that we really, I, I don't think that we really did prior to Katrina as much, but we were forced to. Necessity um, is the mother of invention, they say. And I'm telling you, we definitely forged a lot of friendships, invaluable friendships and relationships uh, so that we could give the care to the people that so desperately needed it. And when we move forward, when there the next catastrophe should happen. We should definitely keep the people who've been on the ground, who've built um, what we have today, they should be the ones really to give you guidance. It shouldn't mm -hmm. come from the top down. It should come from the bottom up. Because we have already shown that we've been very, very effective in what we've been able to do. And um, with meager, meager resources, we've given a lot of care. And I have to commend all of the people who are at this table who have a commitment <coughs> and who have been mission driven to bring about these great results that we've seen today. And that partnership with government has been invaluable. We wouldn't have been able to do it without you guys, but the people who've been doing the work need to guide the work. Thank you. <clears throat> yes. Uh Thank you very much, Congressman. Congresswoman. I, uh, I, would, I would like to reinforce what has already been said, and I think the first and foremost, we'd like to maintain what we, what we have accomplished and maintain what we have. We all, I think most of us at this table, realize that health insurance for everyone is a, is a must. And, and when, you're, when we're dealing with 72% uninsured, we, we see the ravages of that. But I'd really like to <clears throat> help, help make sure that, that we understand that, you know, we understand that cities in California and everywhere else are, are having financial plights. That's, that's very clear. What we'd like to, to encourage you to think about is that, that with the PCASG money, you, you, you took a blank slate and you helped us build a, a health care delivery system that has got a good start. It, it doesn't take massive amounts of money now to, to nudge it on to where we really could become sustainable and we could become permanent and we could grow because as you've already heard, we're coordinating mental health and primary care in ways that we had not been able to do before. And so <clears throat> we really feel like that, that um, it, it, we understand what, is, what it must look like for us to, to be asking for money for just one particular part of the of the country but but you've really helped 
Um, <clears throat> with the PCASG money, you've really helped rebuild a healthcare system better than it was before. And without a little bit of money now, I think, relatively speaking, we'll slip back. We'll go back to where there isn't the primary care. There aren't the community clinics. There are not the, 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 the alternatives to the emergency room care. So we, <clears throat> we really do, first I think and foremost, want you to understand the, the money you've spent has really made a difference. You've really saved a lot of lives. We've really built, start, uh, with, I mean, starting with the governor, Secretary Levine, we've all worked together to build a better health care system. I've, I've been there for 30 years, and I, I, this is the first time I've seen the kind of collaboration and the, and the <clears throat> input that we've had both at the city and the state level in the community clinics. And so uh, we Dr. Really Irvin, can I just uh, request of the chair three more minutes so that we can finish up the panel? It, 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 well, you know, I, I, I would love to do that, but, you know, um, we sort okay, of... Okay, a uh, minute and a half? minute and a half. Okay, <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank a you very much. Yield. Thank you. For you Mr. Uh, Griffin. I appreciate your, your answer. You use the half, and then we'll have the other two ladies split the minute. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, I think 100% access and 100% coverage should be, uh, you asked about reform. That, that's hopefully where everything is going. Uh, and as it relates to the PCASG grant and what's been accomplished in New Orleans, I do think uh, there's been a tremendous accomplishment of changing a system from hospital to primary care. And when you talk about coverage, or excuse me, when you talk about access, um, nationally there, is, there will be a need for more access to primary care. Uh, you could be looking at a model that could be replicated nationally. Uh, the model or, or the, the vehicle for primary care development through the federal government in the past has been through federally qualified health centers. Most of the people sitting at this table, only one of these entities qualify as a federally qualified health center. So this has expanded the opportunity for, uh, through this crisis, but for other entities to actually have more dollars going to primary care and having more primary care delivered in a community. We're changing the uh, lifestyle and the uh, behavior of our population in New Orleans, which in the long run will we, we reduce cost to the healthcare system. And I'll echo a lot of what you've heard, and that is we have the beginnings of a network of care, which I think is part of the answer for healthcare reform in the future. And the other piece that is extremely important in healthcare reform is going to be coverage. And we don't have that piece yet. And so I think what you're hearing is we'd like to see a bridge of funding, whether it's flexibility in the community development block grant funds, or whether it's a waiver for the disproportionate share hospital funding to help support these, these clinics that are an integral part of a network of care. And I would just echo those comments that the coverage promised in the health care reform legislation passed by the House would, of course, help many of these clinics to be sustainable, but the implementation date there is 2013, maybe 2014, depending on the Senate action. And you really do need to think about how to bridge us from where we are today to where we would want to have these clinics be and the people's coverage be in 2013. And I think that involves both phasing in better coverage for some of the low-income people as well as providing for support to these clinics during the bridge or transition period and recognizing that maybe one of the best steps would be to try and develop a plan for how to turn the clinics from freestanding clinics into those that can participate in the federally qualified health center program, which undoubtedly will have to remain a strong part of our health reform efforts for medically underserved areas. Right. The gentlewoman's Thank time has long expired. <laughs> Thank uh, you, but I, Mr. Chairman. But I really felt that the information that we were getting is just so important that we could not interrupt because I think the timing of it, it means so much to us right now here in Washington. So thank you very, very much. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Congressman Kucinich. Thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing on the state of health care in the New Orleans region. Uh, one thing is clear, we must ensure that the clinics and public hospital in the area remain as strong as possible. The need is unusually great there. As someone who believes that Healthcare is a human right. 
I think the people deserve help from the federal government that will enable them to fulfill that need. In the short term, we must shore up the primary care access and stabilization grant funds before they run out. And we must build a new public hospital that is financially sustainable, attracts world-class providers, researchers, and students. If such a hospital provides a little competition for more profitable hospitals with a lower charity care patient mix, then we should embrace that. But this situation needs long-term fixes. A strong public hospital and set of clinics in affected areas are part of that. But New Orleans has uh, for-profit hospitals, Mr. Chairman, around the periphery of the city who collectively take less than 15 percent of the charity care, leaving the rest to go to public hospitals. It's called cherry-picking. It's not profitable to provide health care to those who need it the most. So the for-profit health care industry goes out of their way to avoid it. The result is we're constantly fighting to provide adequate publicly funded health care for the disadvantaged. Now, if we are going to provide sustainable health care for New Orleans, we need to make sure the hospitals that are making uh, big profits are pulling their weight. The failure of profitable hospitals to provide adequate levels of charity care is not simply a New Orleans problem. <coughs> Indeed, in Cleveland, Metro Hospital has a steadily growing patient mix of charity care cases, which presents a growing financial burden that strange, strains uh, uh, their budget, uh, the budget of the county, and of course the budget of patients and providers. So I look forward to working with this committee to address the role of private hospitals and clinics in bringing health care to New Orleans and affected communities all over the nation. I've listened, uh, you know, I read the testimony of the witnesses, and I've heard comments by my colleagues. I've heard one of my colleagues uh, refer to New Orleans as a ward of the federal government. It's interesting, Mr. Chairman, you know, this discussion occurs two days after the President announced an escalation of a war. We have money for war here. We don't have money for health care. We have money for war. We don't have, and Wall Street, we don't have money for health care. So you're struggling. You got a hundred million dollar grant as though you're supposed to stretch that into the next year. You're running out of money to maintain a health infrastructure that was weak before the storm hit. New Orleans was already in, econo in dire economic straits before the storm hit. If there, if there has been a hearing that puts in bold relief more clearly about the distorted priorities of America, I'd like to know what it is other than this one. You're trying to keep alive a health infrastructure to, to assist people, and we're getting ready to spend $160 billion next year on a stupid war in Afghanistan. Billions. I read the Kaiser report here, uh, which spells out the, uh, the statistics, the, the great health care problems that still exist, the infant mortality that was high even before Katrina, the number of AIDS cases, diabetes mortality, comparing Louisiana to the rest of the U.S. I mean, if we can't see that, that, that New Orleans is still suffering. If we can't see that New Orleans has a health care infrastructure that is not adequate to meet the needs of people who, who are still recovering from this hurricane, if, we, if, we, if New Orleans has to come here with a tin cup to beg for money for clinics, to, we're, you have to fight FEMA to try to get the money that you should have got. They're going to arbitration, Mr. Chairman. A new hospital is going to cost over a billion dollars, and FEMA is nickel and diming New Orleans in an arbitration as to whether they're going to get 100, 150 million, or the 492 million that New Orleans wants. This is a disgrace, really. I mean, you know, it's good that you're here to remind us, but we're really our, our country's falling apart, and what's happening in New Orleans is a signal uh, uh, condition 
of where America's priorities are totally fouled up. You should not be here begging, essentially, for recognition. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this. But I'll tell you, I, when the, more I, the more I hear the drum beats for war, and we're going to go bomb poor people in Afghanistan and put a war into Pakistan, we can't even take our own people here at home. How disgraceful. Thank you for being here. Uh, you've got supporters in the Congress who understand uh, that the fate of America is going to be linked to how we are able to take care of communities like New Orleans that are still struggling to survive. And just know that there are people here who are standing right with you on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the gentleman from Ohio uh, for his uh, uh, statement. Um, uh, Congressman Luca Meyer from Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, because of the specificity of the issue that we're dealing with here today and its importance to uh, Representative Gao, uh, I would, uh, Mr. Chairman, yield the balance of my time to Mr. Gao. Uh, I feel he has got more direct impact and probably has a lot more knowledge and a lot more concerns about this issue than what I would have, but I would certainly be supportive of him uh, using all of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Louisiana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank Mr. Lukemeyer for giving me time. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to thank Congressman uh, Kucinich for his uh, passion uh, and for his understanding uh, of the situation in New Orleans. Um, I believe that he is uh, clear on point uh, with respect to the needs of our people down there. We have been struggling for four years uh, to rebuild uh, the Lower Ninth Ward, uh, the New Orleans East. Right now, uh, th there's a population of approximately 80,000 people in New Orleans East and no hospitals uh, to address the needs of the people there. Um, so the, um, the needs are tremendous, and we will continue uh, to require federal assistance uh, to help us move forward in our recovery. Uh, and in talking about recovery, I know that the, the new charity LSU, uh, the LSU VA system, or at least the, the hospitals that we are planning to, to build, um, will serve as uh, an, ec an economic center for, for the city. Uh, Dr. Townsend, if you don't mind, can you please uh, elaborate more on the plans for the VA LSU hospitals, and where are we uh, with respect to that particular project? Certainly, Congressman, thank you. We are, we are in the process of doing the planning for the new academic medical center, but I think it's important to note that we recognize that the charity model is not the model of the future. It's not what we want to see going into healthcare reform, not the best way to take care of patients. So what we're building is a new academic medical center so LSU, in partnership with Tulane, can train our residents and fellows and other healthcare professionals in that setting. And as someone said, we can attract world-class physicians, researchers, do things there like you see in the Birminghams and the Houstons, where many people in New Orleans go for care today. We're exporting patients for health care when we should be able to provide that at home. So what we're doing is we are staying on track with the planning process. We are waiting for a resolution from FEMA. And once we get that, we're going to move forward into this new model. We are on track today to be in that new facility in the beginning of 2014. And so at this point, without knowing the FEMA number, we're still on track. We have not lost any time. But we have an exciting project that we're hoping to move forward on. Thank you, Dr. Stanson. And, and Mr. Chairman, I, the issue with, with FEMA is, uh, is an issue that we've been battling for four years now. And, and Congressman Kucinich is absolutely right. The, the charity system is so integral for New Orleans, and, and FEMA is still nickel and diming the, the city uh, in order for us to get the system back online. And I would uh, really appreciate if we can have a hearing in which we can invite FEMA uh, to explain their position and to to see how we can try to overcome uh, some of this impasse that we are uh, experiencing down there uh, in the district, um, but but I know that the the, the numbers between uh, the state and the city uh, there is a difference of of around three hundred million dollars. Um, can you please um, 
tell the committee how important is it that we should receive the full $492 million to rebuild the system? Someone mentioned the price tag for the project. The, the hospital itself is about a $441 million uh, construction. But the entire complex, so it includes a clinic building so that you can do outpatient, particularly specialty services there on campus. So that $1.2 billion price tag, the, the state has already committed $300 million to that project. And the remainder of the $1.2 billion will have to be financed. And a new entity is being, um, is, is being created that will manage that new academic medical center. So they're going to be responsible for some sort of bond issuance or some way to raise that money. So the difference between raising $800 million or $400 million is significant. So, um, so yes, we are, we are hopeful that, that through the arbitration process that is going on right now, that the state will get a, a favorable declaration from FEMA. And the number that the state has submitted reimbursement for is $492 million. Uh, thank you very much. I saw that my uh, time expired. Yeah, and thank you very much. Uh, and let me just say um, uh, 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 that we really tried to have this hearing in New Orleans, but the schedule just got so messed up that we could not, you know, uh, uh, do that. And of course, um, if, I'm sure if we had had it in New York, uh, in New Orleans, that um, we would have had others involved as well. But the point is that we felt it was just too important not to do it. And because of, and, and also to commend you on the great work that you've done. We wanted to do that as well. And we think that you've done outstanding job in terms of, uh, in spite of even the difficult conditions and circumstances. And now I would like to yield to the gentlewoman from Ohio, uh, Congresswoman Kaptur. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to compliment you for holding this important hearing and uh, for your leadership. And I know how much you care as a healthcare expert yourself. Uh, about what needs to be done in uh, New Orleans and Louisiana and many of the coastal areas that were so damaged by Katrina. I was fortunate to be able to travel uh, to New Orleans and to Mississippi uh, with the, the majority whip, Mr. Clyburn, and with our speaker uh, and others uh, almost two years ago now, I think it was. And uh, that was very, very instructive. And I guess I want to say to all of those who traveled here today uh, from Louisiana, it's really very, it's a gift of the Christmas season that uh, we get to meet angels who are on this side of eternity and uh, who are working and doing God's work. Uh, and I just want to compliment you for, um, you could be doing many other things in your life and you've chosen to do this. And uh, the people of my region I know admire it and view it as very noble effort. So let me compliment you uh, for what you do and, and uh, through my remarks help to give you strength to continue to help those who need it so much. Uh, my question, I have a question and then a comment. Um, Ms. Pachetta, in your testimony, you talk about uh, an adequate sustainability strategy uh, to help uh, NICs in the future. Hopefully, we will be able to get them additional funding. Um, but we would be interested in your suggestions on sustainability. And Dr. Irwin, in your Bridge the Gap, after the public uh, I think it would be important for you to state for the record what that would be. Finally, uh, before you answer, uh, let me just say that when I was down there as a member of the Agriculture Committee, among my other duties here, um, I was just struck by the unmet opportunities to use additional space that's available in New Orleans. And I'm interested in having you submit for the record or comment here today on how the um, added strength of food power and nutrition uh, in your region is being implemented with all those open swaths of land, with the possibility that primary health care clinics could also become food stamp redemption sites for people who grow food in the area. I can tell you in the community that I represent, one of the eight poorest areas in the country now, uh, we get over $100 million a year of food stamps uh, in the region. And I had a great epiphany uh, a few years ago saying, hey, wait a minute, we can turn these into economic development dollars if we can get the people who live in these areas to actually produce the food and turn them into food stamp redemption sites. It's a no-brainer. Uh, so we are about that task. And I'm just curious about these efforts perhaps being made by your associates that could help your health clinics also become nutrition clinics 
and uh, to deal with some of the related health problems that you face. I'm curious about your progress on those. But in terms of uh, my first question, which is sustainability, um, uh, Ms. Prashetta uh, and uh, Doctor, uh, could you comment? And then if anyone wants to say anything on agriculture, I'd be most grateful. I'd be happy to. Um, we've heard that where the rubber hits the road is the uninsurance problem. There simply aren't revenues by definition from that population, and it's a very large population in New Orleans, well above the national average. Could you pull your microphone a little? I don't think I heard you properly there. Sorry. Can you hear me now? The, um, the uninsurance problem in New Orleans is, uh, is um, much more severe than the national average, and that's where the rubber hits the road in terms of sustainability. By definition, that population doesn't provide any revenues to the providers. They're uncompensated care. And historically, the only um, the uh, the funding streams that have um, provided uh, reimbursement for those people are either the dish payments that we've heard about, which are typically to insti to institutions, to hospitals, unless there um, is a way to re redirect them through a waiver. Um, and the HRSA health centers also provide uh, funding for people who are un for health health centers to take care of people who are uninsured. Um, our view is that CMS and HRSA have already made a significant investment in the area um, to try to do this model demonstration of doing health care the right way, primary care, first as the most important building block of the continuum. Um, it really would be a shame to have erosion in the progress that's been made so far if the funds can't be uh, made available to shore up these clinics at this point. And since the grant ends in September, uh, we really don't have 10 months. I mean, it's pretty urgent now in January, you know, to start making sure that plans are in place because what happens if they're not is providers begin to worry about their job security. Um, you know, they need, they need to know that there's going to be um, an, infra an infrastructure in place, patients begin to become anxious about where they're going to get their care. So um, it's important to expeditiously make a decision about whether we're going to continue this investment that has made this progress so far. Thank you. Dr. Irwin? Yes, thank you very much. I'd, I'd like to make a comment about both the sustainability and the nutrition, if I could. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we have tried in a very systematic way to try to uh, deal with the issue of sustainability since the grant came out. That's, that's part of it. We, we appreciated that. Our, our revenues, that patient care revenues that we generated the first year were around $238,000. This year, it's going to be right around $420,000. Uh, we have um, a, a pretty detailed process where we try to re help. We have uh, representatives in the community who work as our partners explaining to people that it's really important for everybody to, to pay what they can for, to help us be sustainable. And so we, uh, we are dealing with the fact that, that we, almost everybody pays at least $20, but the fact is with a 72% uninsured population, that, which is why we get out of bed every morning, we're, we're not going to try to get private pay until the, we find some way for these patients to get their care and met. Uh, we're very hopeful about the uh, expanded eligibility that the Secretary Levine can probably tell you about for, for Medicaid. But that will be two years away. In our, in our budget, we pretty conservatively working with our CPA, we really do think that by year three, if we get a nudge and can continue on by year three, we can be pretty well sustainable. We really do. Uh, if I could just make a comment about the nutrition too. We, we have had as part of our, uh, a, 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 quote, mental health program, a, a, an issue, a program for community health and resilience to try to encourage healthy neighborhoods. We're a small clinic. We, we, we don't kid ourselves about how broad our impact is, but we have partnerships with one of the churches, the Sixth Baptist Church, and we have a, a coffee shop 
that's part of our clinic that's run by the youth groups at the church. There are eight weeks training to become working there. After the first eight weeks when they work in the coffee shop, then they move to the kitchen where they make pralines. We're beginning to sell them on the internet. Um, and we, we have uh, uh, pepper sauce from a community garden that we're selling. So, uh, it, it, you know, it's just sort of a, a light a candle rather than curse the darkness. But it, it, it has created a, a really positive mindset with a lot of the youth particularly. There are an awful lot of kids who have n nothing else to do. And so that we, we feel like that, that this type of thing is well worth our expenditure. We hope that it's the kind of thing that we can continue to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congresswoman, I, I think what, what Don is speaking to is this concept that health is more than getting people to a doctor. And it is an underpinning uh, for all of us in, in what we do. We think of our, of our sites as centers, places where people can come not only to become empowered, to get regular medical care, to learn about their health, but uh, almost all of us have uh, programs that reach out into the community and engage and empower them to build economic opportunity, workforce training, as Don's describing, to help develop community gardens, to, to make it part of the, the healthy, healthier foods in schools. The model here is really going beyond just the idea of a clinic delivering medical care. We feel an obligation to address the social determinants of health as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all. Uh, I now yield to the gentleman from Utah, Congressman Chafee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here. Uh, I'd, I'd actually uh, like to yield uh, uh, the time to Mr. Gao uh, from Louisiana. Um, I'd like to thank the gentleman for yielding. Um, I'd like to ask this question to either members of the panel, maybe to Dr. Townsend, Dr. Irwin, Dr. Uh, DeSalvo, that how does the lack of, uh, of a flagship hospital uh, affect recruitment? Um, and how does this lack of, uh, of recruitment affect the quality of care for the people, especially for the poor uh, people in New Orleans? I'm happy to start. I think um, if, for Tulane's part, um, for the university's part, the charity hospital system, MCLNO, whatever, has been a really important site for workforce training for us for generations. And um, it's the reason I came to New Orleans to train at charity. It's where I did my National Health Service Corps payback. It's, it's part of the fabric of how we develop new physicians, nurses, et cetera. So um, there, there is the element of developing the new workforce to work in the community and, and to stay there to take care of the population that's important. Um, we are also, though, realizing that if you're going to train folks to work in community health centers or expect them to when they complete, they need to have that opportunity. And I think that's really important to shift that educational paradigm as well. For our patients, um, especially for the, those patients of ours who are uninsured, they are by necessity financially triaged. And so the, the um, state hospital system has been really critical in, in providing specialty services and inpatient services for those folks. As has been described, it's probably beginning to bulge at the seams a little bit, and so we need to think about how we improve efficiencies of referrals and communication between the systems so we don't overwhelm them needlessly. Uh, Dr. Townsend? I would, I would say that um, actually some of our recruitment has, has been very good post-Katrina, but it's because of the promise of a new academic medical center, a promise of new labs for research. So if you're going to have those kinds of, um, if th those pieces of the infrastructure are going to be present and are going to stay, we're going to need that new academic medical, medical center. We need a flagship hospital. As far as recruitment for residents, I think it becomes a little more difficult because we can't support the number of residents. Today we're supporting about 300 LSU and Tulane residents and fellows at the hospital because we just simply don't have the volume. The 640 that were there before, they have to be in different places. That education is not as attractive to residents and fellows, so it makes it a little more difficult to recruit. Our medical school recruitment is still going well. I'm happy to say, though, for, for the dean of the medical school at LSU, his recruitment, like I said, with the promise of a new academic medical center, our NIH funding now is actually higher than it was before the storm. But that hospital is critical 
And Dr. DeSalva is right. We need the clinics because that's part of the training that is very important. But we have to have that flagship hospital. We have to have those tertiary and even quaternary care kinds of services that you simply can't get in the outpatient setting. Dr. Irwin. Thank you. It's, it's particularly pertinent to me because I have a son that's a medical student and we're trying to, to uh, recruit him to stay in town. And uh, certainly the, 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 the training that you've heard both of them describe that comes with a flagship hospital that has academic excellence as well as clinical care is critical. We also feel that, um, that, that one benefit from recruitment has been the altruism of the country. We've seen a lot of, of of people who come down who really want to help. But it's, it's very important, we feel, for the people who are going to work in community clinics to train in community clinics. You don't get that training in the hospital. It's a different, different type of practice. And so this, the residents and students who come to town, who come out to our clinics, they make a difference for us. They make a difference in the, the number of patients we can see. They make a difference in the quality of services that we offer. So that the higher quality that comes in, that's really, they don't come for us. They're lured by the flagship hospital, but we benefit from it. Now, there are uh, areas in the second district as well as in uh, Charme Lanson's district that lacks hospital care. Uh, and the statement from Mr. Iza saying that what the state is doing in order to help those people there. My question to you here is, uh, I've spoken with the state, and uh, there might be some issues with respect to how much the state can contribute. Uh, can LSU and Tulane, can you all come together in order to address the hospital, maybe the, the acute care needs of the people of in North East and in St. Bernard, and how can the federal government assist you all uh, in that endeavor? I, I think today, with with the hospital that we have, the public hospital that we have, for for citizens in New Orleans East who are uninsured, I think we're serving them today. As far as being able to serve them in the area, I think it's really important to have primary care, a bigger presence there. And there are some conversations going on right now with the city of New Orleans about the ability to use the medical office building that, um, that was at the former Methodist Hospital to be able to expand primary care services that would be a natural link then into the inpatient care. Um, as far as the as inpatient services without the hospital in New Orleans East, obviously I, I I can't speak for Tulane, but I know that there are always um, contractual relationships that can be formed in order to have providers provide services at different hospitals, because we do that today in the New Orleans region with other hospitals. The gentleman from Utah's time has expired. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I now yield to um, a gentlewoman from California who is the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, who has been very involved in terms of um, um, and supportive of um, getting resources into the um, uh, Louisiana area. Uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me um, thank you uh, for your uh, very uh, consistent leadership um, on this committee and just as a, and as a member of Congress and as a human being uh, with regard to your concern and uh, commitment to ensure that uh, those living uh, in New Orleans uh, actually uh, benefit from what our government has tried to do uh, in the past. It's unfortunate that this natural disaster was turned into a human disaster. And uh, your leadership and this committee's leadership makes us believe that we will be able to do the right thing, uh, but we have to do it uh, now. And I thank you again for inviting me to participate. Uh, as chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, let me just uh, welcome all of you and greet you and just say thank you for being here. Um, most members of the CBC have been to New Orleans many, many, many times. Uh, and uh, each time we go, we want to come back. Uh, we believe we're not doing enough yet, and we have to do more. And so this is an important step in, in the right direction. And I hope, Mr. Chairman, that in the future, um, this committee could uh, lead a delegation to visit New Orleans once again, but look specifically at the primary care, care clinics 
and community care clinics. I'm going to just, if, if that request hasn't been made, just formally request that because I think it's time we come back and especially now during this health care reform debate and part of what we've been uh, insistent on, in, at least in the House bill, was an expansion of community clinics. And so some of us would like to see how that would work uh, post-Katrina because we think if it can work, if it is working uh, in New Orleans, it can work anywhere because of all of the issues, that, uh, the tough issues that you're dealing with. Let me um, ask you a couple of things about uh, medical records. Uh, on a couple of occasions I, I visited and went to the hospitals and talked to uh, some of the uh, personnel and was concerned, they were concerned like many of us, and I know you are about the medical records and how you retrieve medical information from people uh, who are coming back and uh, do you have medical records in terms of the computerization and the technology necessary for uh, retaining now medical records, or how, how did all of that happen uh, with regard to those who lost their homes and had to leave and are now coming back? How do you recapture medical histories? I, I'd like to respond to that. Um, we, we have, I, I think since uh, Katrina, we, we've developed a fairly robust system with electronic medical records. Um, at Daughters of Charity Services of New Orleans, we are, uh, have a paperless system for the most part, and um, it, it, it's backed up out of town so that there is no jeopardy of losing information. Um, and our providers are able to access the, um, the records remotely, and so uh, that has been a, uh, there, there are multiple vendors that uh, entities are using, but um, it has been, of course, helped by this grant because of the uh, uh, operational assistance and, and, and infrastructure that this grant has, has provided. And so uh, that has been a true evolution and, and something that, is, that has uh, worked very well. Um, I'd just like to thank you for all of your, from the Congressional Black Caucus as chair, uh, for all of the uh, work that you've uh, done and, and all you all have done to, to, to uh, look at New Orleans and, and assist New Orleans. And um, also would like to uh, express your sentiment with the chairman. Uh, you know, Mardi Gras is coming up so you all can have a visit or come down in two months if, uh, if you like um, for, for your site visit. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much and thank you for that invitation. I just want to add to what, what Mike's saying that um, the the opportunity from the loss of our paper records was to rebuild it better. And we, we've, we've done that. I think uh, we've felt as a group of community providers that we wanted to move towards a paperless system. We think it's, it's got better safety parameters. It's more accessible for providers. If it's after hours calls that we take on patients, we have the information at our fingertips to help make care decisions to, to let them decide whether the emergency room is the right place or the clinic. It's also really helped advance our programs in quality and quality improvement and helped us to share information to think about how we're going to treat chronic disease like diabetes better. But I've got to ask you, though, for those who lost everything, yes. and I, I say this as the daughter of an 85-year-old mother who walks around with a briefcase with the little notes and medical records because where she lives, you know, they still aren't computerized um, and there's no technology. So to remember, for a, a person who left during the storm, came back, lost everything, how do you reconstruct a record? I mean, I can't remember everything that, for instance, every medication that my mother takes or every diagnosis or, you know, how, how, did, every, how did you do that or, and how do people put all that together again? It's a, it is a lesson learned from this tragedy, really, because we didn't have a lot of that information and so we did not want to go back to that situation if it were to ever happen again and we think for disaster and every day it makes sense to have the information available, not just to providers, by the way. The, the step we are not at yet is the portal for patients because really they own that information and should be able to see at any time um, that, that, they, that they need to have access to it. But what, what, what it took in the beginning everything. was honestly, um, uh, we had we had records in the charity system. That that, that system, some of the, the dictator reports and labs were available. Some of the hospitals had their inpatient el electronic systems, um, and so we pieced it together painstakingly with folks. And it does take quite a long time when you're getting folks reentry over an hour. 
yeah. or more just to find out what happened to them in their lives and make sure it's not lost again. Yeah, and what medications, for mm -hmm. example, uh, understanding uh, the uh, health disparities in the African-American community, you know, diabetes, hypertension, uh, lung cancer, breast cancer. I mean, how do, how do you Dr. reconstruct Townsend the medications? To, you want to talk about the... One of, one of the ad advantages that we had was that um, the collaboration through an HCAP grant, there was a, the PATH partners that many of these folks belong to, including us, we had developed a retrieval system for electronic information. And so that piece of information, that history was available electronically even after the storm. In addition to that, the, pharmacy, um, the pharmacies across the nation, if you ha use a retail pharmacy, you could retrieve that information of filled prescriptions. And then for our patients, most of them don't have a pharmacy benefit. So we access patient assistance programs and they get free medications. But there is an electronic system within the safety net that keeps track of what medications they've received. And so that, that's important information. We were able to reconstitute that information very quickly. That's phenomenal. That's great. But let me ask you one more question, Mr. Chairman, of this panel, uh, as it relates to HIV and AIDS. How uh, are you faring, uh, and how are the rates uh, in New Orleans as it relates to HIV and AIDS, and are people able, I remember earlier, right after the storm, uh, accessing medications and, and getting people back on their meds uh, at the right time and what have you was, was a difficult task. Uh, are the rates now leveled off in New Orleans? Are they going up, going down? Do we need to look at New Orleans and see what we need to do and do it better? Or how, how's, how are things going? H HIV care um, in New Orleans, uh, the, the public hospitals, clinics, the, um, it's called the HOP clinic, the HIV outpatient clinic. That clinic has been reconstituted. People are back in care. They are able to receive medicines. Um, we have always had a really high diagnosis rate in New Orleans. I actually am not sure what that is today. I, my guess is that perhaps because the population's down, the rates may not be as high as they were because we have diagnosed so many, so many of those people. But there are still people who are not in care, and we're still, we're still trying to get those people to the appropriate level of care. And this is one place where we've made such great strides that you can really manage that disease on an outpatient basis. Are you able to do testing initiatives, testing drives? We, uh, we are, and, and, and I think Diane can tell, I believe we have the second highest rate in the nation of HIV after D.C. Um, it's a major problem. There, um, uh, there are programs in place for um, screening, education, identification, uh, triaging people to care. One of the recipients of PCASG is the No AIDS Task Force, which has benefited and been able to grow its programs. So it's, it's, on our, it's on the front of our minds. We know it's a major problem for the population, and quite frankly, the community is very conscious of it. It's of the things that we get requested as a health center to go do screenings on. It's HIV more than diabetes now. Thank you very much. Let me um, thank um, uh, the panel for um, uh, being here, and we really appreciate you know you coming and sharing with us um, because we see it as being very, very important. And of course, we want you to know that you do have a lot of support on this side, and uh, we just hope to be able to uh, move some of these things a lot quicker. But you're again, your coming here has been extremely beneficial. Uh, also, I'd like to just say that um, I also have a letter that is addressed to both uh, Congressman Issa and myself uh, from Melisan uh, regarding this hearing. As you know, he, he represents several of the most effective regions recovering from Hurricane uh, Katrina, including St. Bernard Parish, of course, um, and uh, Plaquemine, of course, and Parish as well, uh, which are um, uh, just east of the city and still recovering. Uh, he has been a leader on recovery, particularly in the areas restoring and building the region's health care infrastructure. I would also like to uh, uh, put this statement in the record, uh, the letter in the record. And let me again thank you so much. Um, uh, and now we move to our second panel. And I apologize uh, for the delay because of votes. And, but in the meantime, you have to vote around here. If not, they talk about you. <laughs> so we now move to our second panel. Thank you. Thank you.
upside down. Will all the witnesses come forward? All the witnesses come forward, please. Let me just indicate before we um, uh, start, I, we swear all of our witnesses in, and uh, what we will do is that we will allow you to start, but we will have to have another break to go and vote. I mean, I really apologize, but uh, uh, they make an issue out of it if you don't vote around here. All right. So you stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. Let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Let us begin with you, uh, Dr. Brand. Thank you so much for uh, being here. Really appreciate you know, and uh, you're being here all day too. Thank you so much. You want to hit your button on your mic, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services and the Administrator of the Health Resources and Services Administration. We appreciate your interest and support of primary care in New Orleans and welcome the opportunity to work with you to strengthen HHS and HRSA programs in the region. I appreciate the remarks of the previous panel and I applaud their fine efforts to provide access to care for the people of New Orleans. HRSA also helps the most vulnerable Americans receive quality primary care without regard of their ability to pay. HRSA works to expand health care for millions of Americans, the uninsured, mothers and their children, those living with HIV and AIDS, and residents of rural areas. HRSA recognizes that people need access to primary health care, and through its programs and activities, it seeks to meet those needs. My testimony will briefly describe the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services primary care Dr. access. Dr. Brand, pull it just a little closer to you, the mic. All right, thank you. I'm one of eight children, and I'm usually told I'm too loud, so I'm... Uh, my testimony will briefly describe the uh, Centers of Medicare and Medicaid uh, Services Primary Care Access and Stabilization Grant and ways that HRSA is working with its partners to provide access to primary care services in Louisiana. In July of 2007, CMS awarded Louisiana the Primary Care Access and Stabilization Grant, a three-year grant of $100 million to assist public and not-for-profit clinics in the greater New Orleans area to expand access to primary care, including primary mental health care to all residents, low-income and uninsured residents. The grant was designed to support the long-term sustainability of primary care in New Orleans. The grant required sustainability plans within the grant application and tapered funds over the life of the three-year grant. The Louisiana Department of Health and Hospitals made provisions with the Louisiana Public Health Institute to help the state administer and oversee this grant's day-to-day -day operations. As we have heard from the previous panel, the organizations receiving PSSG 
operates about it operates 91 primary care and behavioral health clinic sites across the region, including fixed and mobile facilities. As of September 2009, these clinics have served approximately 252,000 patients. The department is pleased with the improvements in primary care access that have resulted from this grant, and HHS looks forward to continuing our close partnership with the state and local health care organizations to meet the primary care needs of residents in the Gulf Coast. HRSA's efforts to support primary care in post-Katrina New Orleans include support for health centers, the primary care workforce, and infrastructure. Health centers are community-based and consumer-driven organizations that serve populations with limited access to health care. These include low-income populations, the uninsured, those with limited English proficiency, individuals and families, families experiencing homelessness, and those living in public housing. These centers are designed to provide accessible, dignified health services to low-income families. In 2004, prior to Hurricane Katrina, HRSA funded two health center grantees that supported 10 sites in New Orleans, serving 17,500 people. Since 2006, HRSA has funded seven additional applications. HRSA provides grant support to five health center grantees in the greater New Orleans area. This includes four existing health center grantees that received $7.1 million in 2009 to operate 18 sites and ser service 34,000 people. The fifth health center is a new grantee that received funding under the Recovery Act. New Orleans has additionally benefited from Recovery Act funding and has received 13 awards that support new health center access points, increased demand for services, and capital improvement awards. The Recovery Act funding will allow these primary care providers to see an additional 35,000 patients at more than 20 clinics across the area over a two-year period. Two of the health centers are using these funds to provide additional mental and behavioral health services, which we know from our discussions today are critical to this region. In addition to providing direct patient care, HRSA strengthens primary care by placing health care providers in communities where they are needed most. The National Health Service Corps, through scholarship and loan repayment programs, helps health profession shortage areas in the U.S. obtain primary care. And Dr. DeSalvo, who was on the previous panel, is an excellent uh, example of the National Health Service Corps loan repayment program. In addition to supporting a National Health Service Corps, we directly support health professions programs that provide infrastructure for training and education, and this includes the Southwest Area Health Education Grant. Um, we also provide resources to address particular patient population challenges, including women and children. And as of um, this summer, we had another um, grant that would support um, care for people living with HIV and AIDS. HRSA provides Ryan White Care Funds to the New Orleans AIDS Task Force, and they provide comprehensive HIV care for about 800 people living with HIV and AIDS. We are extremely proud of our programs and look forward to continuing to work with you, Mr. Chairman, and members of the committee to provide quality primary care for all. Uh, HHS has invested a great deal of time and resources in assisting the recovery of New Orleans, and there's much more work to be done, and we're looking forward to collaborating with you in that effort. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Brand. Uh, just before we start, um, um, Mr. Levine, we're going to break until 2.15, and we will return at 2.15. Uh, we hate to do this, but we have to make these votes, and then we'll start again and, of course, hope that we won't have any more votes until we are finished. Thank you, and, and I hope you understand. So we will actually adjourn until, recess us to say, until 2.15. Yeah.